Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Good Gram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Okay, so this afternoon we're going to carry on looking at uh, independent bottling companies. Um, this week it's uh, Claxton's turn. Um, and um, as you know, I'm a big fan of the uh, the independent sector of, uh, of the, the whiskey market. And um, I, I love the, the sort of the turnover, the fact that, you know, each bottling by and large is a single cast bottling there's a finite number of those and as soon as they're gone we're on to something else and uh, um, there's a couple of other things that I love about Claxton's I mean they've not been going particularly long and uh, obviously when they initially set up they, they asked me a few questions asked for my, uh, my my advice which was really nice I mean um, obviously I hope I was as helpful as, uh, as I possibly could be and um, you know, since since then they've they've been pretty much like every other independent bottling company. They've bottled some exceptionally good whiskies and some not quite so exceptionally good whiskies, which is always par for the course. I mean, obviously, um, Adrian would probably disagree with my assessment of that because you know they select the casks, they they select casks that they think are particularly good and uh, and, and bottle them. And obviously, then someone like himself comes along and goes. Mm, no, nah, not quite so sure about that, mate. Um, and um, I guess it's, it's uh, like I said, any criticism that I tend to level at any any particular bottling, I like to think it's constructive criticism. It's not just criticism for the sake of it. Um, and you know, by and large, these episodes of the show, I'd rather sort of highlight good whiskies rather than than bad whiskies. You know, I don't want to sort of criticise people's work, but sometimes you know you. The, the, like with everything, when you put your work out there um, on the on the marketplace, you have to accept that they may well be some criticism as, as well as some praise. But anyway, the other thing that I love about Claxton's is the bottles. I mean, I know there seems to be not a debate, but there, there seems to be people that love them and people that don't. I personally really like them. I think they're distinctive. They're different. The only negative I have is the fact that they take up so much shelf space and so you can only have a handful on the shelf and you know suddenly your shelf has kind of disappeared and hence the bottles tend to have a tendency to move around the shop shall we say uh, a fair amount um, when uh, when space is required shall we say I mean um, but you know by the by I mean I love the bottle shapes I, I think they're really distinctive they're different I mean, there's a, a kind of luxury feel to them. It's a nod to sort of, um, you know, exo cognacs and things like that in the bottle shape. I mean, I've certainly seen a few bottled in that particular type of bottle. And uh, and hell, why not? You know, I mean, at the end of the day, there's a, there's a lot of independent bottling companies on the market, a lot of jostling for shelf space. And although, as I've said in the past, I think the whiskey drinkers are less um, governed by packaging and frippery should we say than say gin drinkers um, certainly you know if a bottle stands out on the shelf it's going to catch your attention but at the end of the day the, the show is not about uh, the aesthetics of, uh, of packaging it is about what is indeed inside said bottle that's to me what the most important thing is you can have the, the the prettiest and most luxurious packaging and bottle ever but if your whiskey inside it is pretty awful then um, well yeah, you're kind of fooling people should we say um, maybe deliberately or maybe not deliberately as the case may be but anyway I think that's uh, that's enough of uh, enough of that and um, I think it's just time to uh, have a look at today's one. Okay, so we're going to kick off with uh, uh, the English whiskey from the St George's Distillery, and it seems to me that uh, there's been quite a fair amount of this cropping up in the independent sector of, uh, of late. It seems to me that pretty much most independent bottlers have now got or have put uh, a bottling on their list. And um, the interesting thing about this is that it is uh, a five year old rum cask. I, I believe it's spent its entire life in an ex rum cask. And uh, I think the memory serves me right. I think the distillery have done releases either rum cask finished or wholly rum matured. I, I forget now. Um, so this was distilled in April of 2011, uh, bottled. Um, earlier this year and bottled at the whopping 60.5%. Certainly 
the English whisky hangs on to its, uh, its alcohol, shall we say. Um, the second bottling we'll be looking at is uh, Glen Moray. This was distilled in November of 2005. It's 10 year old uh, from a first fill bourbon barrel and uh, uh, is bottled at 54.5%. Oh, third one we're going to be looking at is a Macduff. Yes, good old Macduff, as they say. Uh, as you well know, Macduff is one of the uh, founding members of the Axis of Evil. And um, shall we say they're... Uh, every dog's tail wags at some stage, shall we say. And I think sort of, you know, I've come across some, um, some what I consider to be pleasant Macduff. I've come across some... Not so pleasant, Macduff, shall we say. So it'll be interesting to see where this one fits in in the pantheon of Macduff bottlings. Um, so this is a 14-year-old. It was distilled in March of 2003. Sherry butt, apparently. Um, pretty refill sherry butt, I would imagine by the, the colour of that. I would, I would be more thinking it was a, an American oak uh, uh, cask, shall we say, judging by the colour or the lack of. Anyway, bottled at 55.9%. And now we're going to come on to two interesting bottlings. They're both bottlings of Glen Keith. Now, it's not often that independent bottling companies release two bottlings of the same distillery in the same range. I mean, you often get, say, for example, with... Um, Douglas Lang or Hunter Lang, they may well sort of have an OMC bottling of, of that particular distillery and then maybe a provenance bottling or whatever. But it's unusual to see the same whiskey bottled, uh, you know, even if there are differences. And there are differences between the two. The first is a 22 year old distilled in uh, November of 2005 from a refill bourbon hogshead uh, and bottled at 49.2. The second bottling is um, a year older, distilled in uh, December of 1994 from a bourbon barrel. Um, obviously the barrel being slightly bigger, um, not much difference in the colour, maybe there's actually a little bit more colour from the, uh, from the, the bourbon barrel. Um, may well be first fill, don't think it's a first fill, certainly uh, the information I have doesn't say first fill. Anyway, so it's a, a first, uh, a bourbon barrel and bottled at 51%. And the last one we'll be looking at is uh, the oldest of the six. Uh, this is an Ockentoshan, uh, distilled in October of 1991, thus making it 26 years old, and was aged in a sherry hoggy. And as you can see, reasonable amount of colour and uh, one imagines a refill sherry hoggy because generally what tends to happen is that uh, the butts will arrive in stay form and then they'll be reconstructed and sometimes it's a case of maybe there's an odd stave or two that's uh, a bit dodgy um, and thus necessitates shrinking the size of the barrel sometimes it's just done purely for cosmetic terms or storage terms I guess but uh, I, I think more often than not butts are broken down into uh, hoggies or barrels mainly due to the, the, the state of the car, the star, staves shall we say so anyway um, so yeah that's today's little lineup I think it's quite interesting uh, there is a, a missing bottle um, only because I decided to choose six out of the seven the seventh release these are all brand new releases by the way that uh, should be hitting the shelves back now really and um, the other bottling was a, a bottling uh, I think it was a 10 year old Orkney from that well known Orkney distillery and I'm afraid it it was, yes, as you would expect, youngish Highland Park. And it's quite interesting because we, we, we think of sort of the halcyon days of, uh, of whiskey production. We think of the 80s and 90s, the early 2000s, and distilleries struggling with money and filling their stuff into sort of poor casks. And some distilleries, Highland Park, Glen Turret, uh, and, and Jura uh, are prime examples uh, where their spirit from those days, or certainly their younger spirit in inverted commas, is considerably, in my personal opinion, cleaner and a lot better than what they're currently releasing. But anyway, that's beside the point. We're not here to talk about something that we're not tasting. What we are here to talk about is what I am tasting. So let's kick off with a bit of English then, shall we? 
Right, okay, so it's uh, six years old and it's spent its life in a rum cask. Let's see what the man gives. Well, the rummy dried fruit is, is quite noticeable, but but like uh, like a lot of uh, of the English whiskies that I've seen that have been aged in, in different types of cast types, the balance is really very, very good. I'm certainly getting a plenty of barley, a bit of white fruit, a touch of honey, a little bit of straw, so it's kind of coming across a little bit older than six years old. And, and as we know, obviously, the, the weather in uh, Norfolk is a, a tad warmer than it is in Scotland, so as we know, maturation is a little bit faster. Um, and this certainly hasn't uh, done any, any harm to this whatsoever. And like I said, it's got a, a, a lovely character to it. Um, it's balanced, there's a little bit of sweetness to it. There's a bit of barley sweetness, a bit of dried fruit sweetness. And you can certainly smell that that 60 odd percent. I mean, I haven't got really enough to sort of warrant putting a little drop of water with this. So I'm just going to have to taste it neat. And um, But having tasted it, diluted I think I personally prefer it um, prefer it neat but um, anyway let's, let's see what the power gives us Actually, the alcohol's really well integrated for something that's 60%. Yes, you get a little bit of shortness on the finish, and the alcohol does kind of come through. But that's actually pretty drinkable. It's actually pretty well contained, and it balances the sweetness. I, I think um, from uh, looking at um, uh, my tasting notes, it certainly brought out the oak um, and um, brought out the sweetness as well because that alcohol is kind of containing the honey, the, the rummy dried fruits, the sweet barley, the apricot. Um, well, it's got a lovely finish to it now, lovely aftertaste. So I'm getting white fruit, a little bit of possibly elderflower-ish, that kind of sort of white floral note. Um, the barley, mm, that is actually really, really nice. A little grippy possibly, a little bit of spice from the oak, not a huge amount, but then it's only spent six years in that particular cask. Um, but all told, I, gee, I think that's absolutely fantastic. I really like that. That's a great one. Kick off with. Right, okay, so let's move on to the Glen Moray. Now, <laughs> Pretty much Glenmorey is a banker really at the end of the day. Um, the, the quality of the, the spirit that the distillery produces is, is pretty spot on and it's one of those few distilleries where you sort of see an independent bottling and you pretty much know what you're going to get. Um, other distilleries can be a bit more variable or, um, but you know you stick Glenmorey in a, well first of all bourbon cask in this this case and you're pretty much guaranteed you're going you know what you're going to get so let's see if I'm indeed correct quite chunky actually for for a moray um I mean that is probably more to do with the with the sort of like the first fill uh, American oak it's got quite a bit of coffee and toffee but that crispness of spirit the sort of the sort of spaceide minerality grassiness is is all there quite honeyed as well, a lot of barley. Yeah, that's an absolutely delightful nose, it has to be said. It's, it, like I said, it's more of the sort of maybe robust, more rounder and um, more oaky than, than a lot of Glen Moray's, but um, certainly there's absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. It's getting quite aromatic now, I'm getting quite a bit of, um, a, 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 of sort of lighter, slightly estery, um, honey kind of notes and again that is just a, an absolutely delightful nose this is the sort of whiskey that that i really really like i like fruity whiskies i mean i like all whiskies but i find that sort of you know i, I, I like a nice sort of fruity characterful whiskey um I, i'm much less keen on the more industrial styles as you well know but um yeah this is uh, 
yeah, like I say, robust, but uh, but quite pretty much well balanced, I think. So yeah, Let's see what the, the power gives us. That's got a lovely progression. It kicks off with the sort of the lighter barley led spirit, a little bit of grass, white fruit. The oak then starts to slide in and I would have expected it to be the other way around. Um, I would expect the oak to have come belting in sort of pretty early on, but it doesn't. It actually kind of gradually moves in. I'm getting toffee, a little bit of coffee, honey, barley, and then the, the oak sort of just kind of tapers off a little bit and the barley and the, the minerally white fruit, the grass, the citrus, you know, kind of comes back on the finish. Yes, the alcohol is kind of helping to keep that balance alive uh, and, and make the finish a little austere. But, you know, again, the honey, the barley, it kind of lingers really nicely. Um, and, yeah, I, I think, yeah, an, another fabulously good bottling. That is just... Mm, absolutely spot on. So great, I'm see my only way to face it all. Right. Like Look at that time. Let's see what we're going to get then. Well, it has distillery character. I'm not going to deny that. That has that sort of slightly hard, industrial, barley character. Um, but there's... You know, some sweet oak, um, it's got a little bit of toffee, a little bit of dried fruit, very subtle dried fruit it has to be said, so um, I'm guessing this is quite a, a reasonably well used uh, sherry, but on the whole it's actually quite well balanced. The oak is starting to sort of become slightly dominant, um, which I guess in this instance is probably not a bad thing. Um, it's not the best McDuff I've ever tasted, or nosed, as the case may be. It's certainly not the worst. Um, and, um, and you certainly can't um, criticise it for not having any distillery character. Um, it, the distillery character is certainly there. Um, but it's actually, it's, it's actually relatively clean, um, aside from the slight industrial character. That I, I'm not getting that kind of fainty burnt rubbery kind of character that you often get with uh, with Macduff so so although I kind of don't think I would want to put it on the shelf it has to be said I think if if you like that kind of style of whiskey then um, I think this has certainly got plenty of other things going on shall we say that uh, kind of balances up that um, industrial kind of character anyway let's see what the palette gives us then shall we Ooh, that's a bit industrial, it has to be said. It's probably a little bit more industrial on the palate. Um, again, there's plenty of oak character. There's, a, there's the soft toffee, the dried fruit. Um, it's one of those kind of whiskies where if I was tasting it blind, I would think it might have been a sherry finish because the sherry is very, very light and only really just noticeable. Um, but, you know, like I said, there's got plenty of other things to offset the slight industrial character. There's a little bit of white fruit on the finish, a little bit of minerality. Um, and, and it's relatively clean. I mean, you know, that, that industrial character does not necessarily always mean dirty. Um, it's just the way it is, shall we say. Um, it's a bit hard and, and the barley comes across a bit hard and... Um, but, you know, I think as, as, as far as Macduff goes, that is not, not too bad at all. So, um, like I said, although it's not a style that I particularly warm to, the Glen Moray is more my kind of style of whiskey, it's certainly not, not, a, not a poor whiskey. Um, so, yeah, it's okay. Tea's so to nothing. Oh. 
Right, okay, so let's move on to the first of the two Glen Keiths. This is the 22 year old, uh, aged in a, a refill uh, bourbon hoggy, and uh, let's see what the nose gives us. That's lovely, it's subtle. Um, there's some lovely orange and lime conserve, a touch of straw like barley. Definitely got some maturity. I mean, you can smell the, the maturity to it. Not a huge amount of oak in actual fact. Um, I mean, which is probably not a surprise given the, the, the coloration of the whiskey. The oak is very, I mean, you would expect more sawdusty kind of oak at this kind of age, but I'm not getting that at all. It's kind of very subtle. There's a little bit of vanilla. It's all very sat in the background. Um, but it's, you know, Glen Keith is a lovely whiskey. Um, you know, I've tasted a, a fair few of them. I don't know. I probably should have checked before doing it whether they, the distillery do a bottling of themselves. But I have a funny feeling that they don't, but they could do. But, you know, it's... It's one of those ones you just don't really see very often, and a lot, a lot of sort of people would probably overlook it. Um, but you know, the distillery itself seems to produce some lovely spirit, and this certainly is absolutely no exception. Uh, exception, shall we say? A um, little bit of oily apricot coming out now, but it's that lovely kind of citrus, like I said, that sort of orange or tangerine lime conserve kind of note that's really really appealing and it's not too sweet that's that's the thing um again it's just really nicely balanced and now i'm getting some vanilla notes coming through um ah, it's just fabulously balanced really nice Let's see what the palette's like That has got lovely progression. It opens with more of the oak. I'm getting more of the creamy vanilla, a little bit of toffee, touch of nuts, proline-ish kind of notes. Um, and then that mature spirit kind of comes in, a little bit of baked apricot, um, honey, minerals, white fruit. Really freshens towards the finish um, and becomes a not austere but a lot more citric and, and you get the lime and a little bit of lemon um, and it's got a real palate cleansing finish it has to be said uh, and that's lovely really vibrant lovely balance of, of, of vibrancy and maturity um, the oak is not ephemeral but it does kind of come in quite early on and then kind of dissipate out but it just kind of adds to the sort of the whole progression of the of the whiskey um, and, and as you know I'm a bit of a sucker for progression I don't want the whiskey to just taste exactly the same from beginning to end I want to sort of you know have a be taken on a journey so to speak and uh, that one certainly does so yeah hats off that's a that's a very very Okay, and so moving on to the 23 year old Glen Keith, like I said, this is a bourbon barrel. Um, so let's see what the nose gives us. Even less oak in actual fact. Um, really minerally and flinty and quite. Um, granity um, rather than hard. Um, but oh. It's got a lovely underlying sort of uh, honeyed note. I mean, a real kind of held in, effusive, you know, uh, aromatic honeyed character. The oak is kind of coming out now. It's, it's becoming quite sort of toffied. Um, although it's still, again, it's sitting in, in, in the background. It's probably now... There's a right battle going on. I mean, the, the spirit character is really crisp, really fresh. Um, and certainly, yes, there's a, a mature element there, but it seems a little younger than the previous bottling, when in actual fact it's a little older. That's ah, really juicy, really honeyed, really full, and 
it's just, it, one of these it's one of these whiskies I love because it just keeps changing in the glass one minute you're, be, you're you're getting the creamy oak next minute you're getting the minerality you're getting the barley um oh, that is just that is stunningly good absolutely fantastic as a, a, like I said it's just got a lovely maturity sort of not quite tropical um but it's certainly sort of heading in that direction. Hmm. See what that goes. Oh, that's a lot more oak on the palate. Big, buttery, creamy, slightly bitter. Um, I'm certainly getting a lot of American oak, uh, a lot of bourbon-y kind of notes. Less about the, the spirit character, Less there's less of that kind of honeyed um, fruit. I think it kind of, it, it kind of at the end of the day, it's, it's it's how do you like your whiskey? Do you like your whiskey to have a reasonable amount of oak character? I mean, and it's certainly still pretty well balanced, even if the emphasis is slightly shifted more towards the oak um, than the spirit. Yes, it's got a lovely kind of citric finish, real crisp, fresh, minerally citric uh, finish, but the oak is a little bit more dominant. Um, and so, for me personally, I I prefer the the ninety five to the ninety four. But either, each each of those two whiskies have certainly got um, got their, their their plus points, should we say? But um, the oak is a, a little bit heavier. Okay, and so finally, we're on to the Ockentoshan. Um like I said, uh, 26 years old, a sherry hogshead. Let's see what that is. Big, leafy, oloroso, e dried fruit, touch of treacle. There's a an edginess there. It's not something ooh, it's kind of mm, dancing on the edge of sulfur um it's not too it is it's it's, a, it's loads of sherry at the end of the day um pruney whiny herbally I, you can sense some spirit underneath all of that but i mean you know i've never never been a big fan of ockentosh and sherry it's kind of slightly to a certain extent defeating the object of the exercise um, I mean certainly I'm getting no rose petals I'm getting no Turkish delight strawberry mousse yada 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 you know what I would expect from from Ockentosh and it's all just big sherry and like I keep saying with with these types of whiskies there are people that love big sherry monsters and um, I'm just not one of them because at the end of the day it's all about the cask and I'm not getting any any input really from the spirit. That, that, that could come from anywhere in, in, in fact and um, that's my biggest gripe about sherry matured whiskies is that they all have a tendency to taste of or have the aromas of the cask unless it's refilled sherry and then or you've vatted it in or yeah etc etc you know when you've got a little bit more balance and um you know because i'm not against the use of sherry cars so I, I, I like a judicious use of sherry but when it becomes all-encompassing and the the focal point of a whiskey i just start to think well i'd rather have a glass of sherry you know um Oh, it's just dancing on the edge, it has to be said. It's it's kind of, you know, I can see I can see why it's been bottled. I mean, and but again, and, and, and another, another time, unless you have a really old sherry whiskey, they kind of seem to sit in this time warp. No, time warp's the wrong word, but this kind of a sort of mid-ground of 
well, I'm sort of ish a little bit mature, but yeah. And this one is exactly the same. I mean, you know, again, if I'd have smelt this blind, I would be really hard pushed to say this was 26 years old. Yes, there is a little bit of maturity there. There's a little bit of that slightly Armagnac-y kind of character. But, okay, maybe I'm getting a little bit of rose petal now. Maybe I'm searching for it. I don't know. But um, maybe there is a, a little bit of distillery character kind of coming through now. But, like I said, the, the, the main focus of this nose is, is the cask. Anyway, let's see what the power goes. Rich, pruny, raisinated, showing more more maturity on the palate. With it has that armagnacky kind of character coming through now. The sort of oxidised fruit, um, and you know, if I'm tasting an armagnac, that's what you'd expect. That's what you'd want from sort of you know a twenty odd year old armagnac. You'd want that kind of dried fruit, kind of armagnacky kind of character. Um, but I'm getting no distillery character. I'm getting... I feel like a stuck record, to be bluntly honest with you. Um, yes, it's cleaner than the nose. Um, and there's certainly uh, people that, that, that would really go for this in a, in a big way because it's loads and loads of sherry, loads of pruniness, wininess, yada, 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 dark treacle. It's almost kind of like you can almost write these sort of tasting notes... <laughs> You know, off pat to, to to be honest with you, but um, you know, it is what it is. At the end of the day, it's you know a twenty six year old Lowland whiskey that's been aged in you know sherry cask. So, if that's your your cup of tea, so to speak, then that's your cup of tea, isn't it? One, two, three, four, two. Okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show up. Um, well, I mean. Oh, hello. I wondered when the putty cat was going to arrive. Well, you missed all the whiskey, haven't you? Anyway, right. So, <laughs> so we kicked off with English whiskey, which was absolutely fabulous. I love the English distillery. I love what they're doing. Um, I, it just, it's just great whiskey at the end of the day, you know. And it, again, it's kind of like the Glen Moray. It's kind of... Um, when you see even an independent bottling of unpeated English whiskey, you kind of know exactly what you're going to be getting because the distillery's consistency is absolutely spot on, isn't it? Yes. And talking of the Glen Moray, the Glen Moray was fabulous. I mean, that it really is my kind of kind of whiskey. It's got loads and loads of fruit, maybe a little heavy on the oak, possibly, um, but that certainly gave it a kind of robust character. Um, when it tends to be a little bit more sort of focused, a little lighter. Um, but even so, you know, that is, you know, absolutely spot on. Really, really nice. The Macduff, well, like I said, it's certainly not the the worst Macduff that I've ever come across. It's not the best, but, you know, it's it's Macduff at the end of the day, you know. And you can't argue that it's it, it has some distillery character, shall we say. So, so yeah, OK, not, not, not too bad. Um, the 22-year-old uh, Glenkeith, yeah, I really like that. That was just such a lovely whiskey. Um, real nice balance between um, oak and maturity, or maturity and, and, and youthfulness, for want of a better word. Um, sort of balancing oak, not too over, over the top on, on the oak front, and just all round a really, really lovely whiskey. Um, the 23-year-old Glenkeith, again, yeah, again, Fabulous whiskey, really, really nice. A little bit more oak character, and it's a case of I think you, you, know, you choose which one I think would be the, the sort of more suited to your palate. Should we say if you want a little bit less oak and you want a little bit more spirit character, you'd go for the for the, uh, the the 22 year old. If you want a bit more oak character in your in your older whiskey, then obviously go for the the other one. So yeah, courses for courses really at the end of the day, and the oak and toshin. I don't know how much that's retailing for. I must admit, I haven't kind of worked that one out. But um, let's put it this way: it ain't going to be cheap. And again, it's one of those sort of whiskies that, well, you know, you're either going to love or you're going to, well, 
necessarily hate, but be, should we say, slightly ambivalent about. And um, I'm afraid I kind of fall into the slightly ambivalent camp. Mm, not a surprise, really. But then that's my taste in whiskey. And obviously my taste in whiskey is not the same as everybody's taste in whiskey. That's just the wonderful thing about whiskey. Everybody's tastes are different. People like different things. And, you know, um, what may appeal to one person may not necessarily appeal to another. I will say that the palette is, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty good. I mean, it's clean. There's a little bit of a mm, iffy note on the nose, but certainly I've, <laughs> I've come across a lot bloody worse in, in the way of sulfur sherry casks and, uh, than that, shall we say. So, so yeah, that's this week's episode of the show. Um, I, I, I hope you've enjoyed it. I mean, I'd just like to say a big thank you for all the comments you've made on uh, and, and all the likes and all the views of the uh, of last week's episode of the show. Uh, I'd like to think this is a you know, balanced um, review of uh, of these whiskies. And um, yes, well, I guess um, nothing much more to say than um, I'll see you next week. Yes, purry creature. <laughs>